Hi, I'm Noam Wasserman, Dean of the Sy Sim School of Business at Yeshiva University. I was a longtime professor at Harvard Business School, an entrepreneur, and a venture capitalist. I wrote the bestseller, The Founder's Dilemmas. And I'm Charlie Harari. I've been working with companies for over 10 years. And that book, Founder's Dilemmas, and the challenges faced by the 10,000 founders in it is the basis of this podcast. We are delving into the issues faced by startups to help you avoid the pitfalls that claim so many good companies. Let's get started. Okay, and welcome back to another episode of the Founders Lumbus Podcast. I'm Charlie Harari here uh, with Dean Wasserman. For those who are, if you're turning in right now, check out last week's episode. Uh, we had an incredible guest there. I'm sure you're going to really enjoy it. And we have an incredible guest tonight. So thanks for tuning with us right now. And as always, Dean, what do you have for us tonight? So tonight for our next star, we're going to put on the hot seat, uh, Gilles Yaakov Gade, who is the founder and CEO of Cross River Bank. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of the background and then be able to set the table. First, thank you so much for taking the time to be able to impact our next generation. Uh, to give a little bit of the background, and you'll be able to hear a lot more as we get further into it, as he fleshes out pieces of his life. Uh, started off in France, uh, started off in Paris for school, and then early investment banking experience uh, that he had there. Um, uh, then headed into what should have been a multi-stage uh, journey through investment banking and venture capital. And he started off first at Bear Stearns doing it. But then he made the mistake of getting married. And for the first couple of years, Shana Rishona times two, uh, he took off and learned, uh, negotiated, I guess, the terms of the, the marriage uh, that he'd be able to go back into the base mattress for a couple of years. Uh, after that, I guess the realities of Parnassa hit um, and he went back into the, uh, into the working world. Um, he went into, uh, back into investment banking. He did it in the, the States at Barclays um, and then had the fortune to pick a good boss who when that boss left to, find, to found a company, um, had him be a key pe me member of the team. Uh, and uh, so Chella Technology Partners will hopefully get into some of the things about how that shaped you. Um, but then having been on the, buy, on the sell side, he decided to move to the buy side and became the chief financial officer at Meridian. And so hopefully we'll get into some of the things that shaped those decisions, those forks in the road, and also how seeing both the buy and the sell sides might have affected Cross River and uh, uh, the creation of the ultimate founder, if you will, uh, being able to leap into that. 2008, and hopefully we'll be able to get into some of this, founding in a recession. Uh, was that a plus? Was that a minus? Uh, what are some of the lessons that came from that? Um, and then since then, the founder, CEO, and uh, the, the head cheerleader at Cross River Bank. Um, uh, one of the fun things that I found also along the way there, there was, uh, this is one of the few tweets that, that we have had from, from Yaakov. Uh, this is back in 2017. He must be very proud of this because uh, he doesn't tweet too often, but uh, he was, they were nominated at Cross River for Most Innovative Bank. Uh, this is from the Lendit uh, organization. And the finalists, which would you pick as the most innovative bank. You had Goldman Sachs, anyone heard of them? You had ICIC, uh, ICICI Bank, Santander Bank, UBS, one of the biggest, and then Web Bank, and Cross River Bank. And which do you think won? Which one? I, I don't recall, is that? Uh... <laughs> so at least the tweet said, I don't recall they won any, most innovative bank. All the things bank. you just said, like this is way. Someone's won too many awards, I guess, but. <laughs> With that as our intro, a little bit of the table setting. Uh, thank you again for taking the time and uh, coming on board. Th thank you for thank you for setting the bar very high. And now, you know, and you definitely didn't manage the audience expectations. So, you did a good job there. We like to set them high and beat them. So, okay. So let's head into it. Dive into pre-Cross River. Uh, some of the things that we teed up. Who do you consider the key influences on you during the early days in terms of your direction that you decided to take, your career and your life? Um, so that, that's probably one of the easiest questions I'm gonna get tonight, I figure. Um, upbringing, parents, grandparents, um, role models, very hardworking, dedicated, um, had to move numerous times in their lifetimes. Um, they had to um, uh, move because of wars, because of uh, expulsions. Um, just the, you know, wandering Jew uh, personified. And, um, and that really um, shaped a lot of the table stakes for um, preparing me, I guess, and my family for life. 
in uh, not to complain too much and, um, and just to roll up your sleeves all the time and just to, uh, this isn't such a thing as an obstacle. And it's, uh, there are plenty of opportunities out there. It's just a matter of identifying them and seizing them at the right time. Um, but I would say later on in life, um, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs is probably the most influential person in my entire life. I never met him, and unfortunately. And I wish I had the opportunity just to thank him for, first of all, his prolific writing and speaking, but just to be an inspiration and a walking Kiddush Hashem. And unfortunately, I didn't have the privilege, um, or the schus, really, uh, to be able to tell that to him. Uh, but I try to pay tribute to his memory every single time, every single speech. Every time I write something, I even speak to my staff. There is really a speech that I give that does not have a quote from him or an idea from him. What is one gem that you took away from him that you would point to? So um, he loved to talk about the men in the arena, um, you know, from Theodore Roosevelt. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, the difference between a uh, stumbling block and a, a stepping stone is the way you use them. Um, and, um, and basically he's trying to identify the, uh, the good parts of life that makes us really proud to be a Jew. Um, his definition of Judaism, his definition of the state of Israel, his love for Jews as a whole, and his interpretations of the, um, of the weekly parasha are all lessons that I just cherish every single day. Um, his, uh, uh, particularly his definition of leadership, which I think he got himself from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, um, whereby he actually went to see the Lubavitcher Rebbe, if I tell the story correctly, and, um, and he asked him, he said, I'm about to become a rabbi. I, I had chosen a totally different career path. And, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe told him, uh, you need to do that um, because of one thing, but don't forget that. He said, good leaders make followers. Great leaders make leaders. And, and this really inspired me. And, and the way he tells that story particularly is in, under the context of influence versus power, um, whereby you have our forefathers, including Moshe Rabbeinu and Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and they all were fantastic leaders. And particularly Avram is probably the Avram superstar, the most respected of all our forefathers, the more revered, created three quarters of uh, the world's religion, and certainly ethical monotheism. And nonetheless, he had no army, he had, uh, uh, you know, he had no uh, trailblazing idea. It was just one man, one mission, just to cross the divide and to make sure that to bring morality and conscience to the world. Now look at the world today. That is influence. And the uh, antithesis of this is trying to, you know, impose power on people and masses. And, um, and that means that power is div div uh, divisive. divisive. Um, power is, a, is a, um, an, an attribute that people use to, uh, I love to use um, in order for them to do something that they don't themselves feel 100% comfortable doing. So like, for example, he gives the example of a, um, of a captain or a general that has several captains. In order for the general to um, execute orders or to have his troops ex execute orders, he has to divide the power that he's, that he's assuming. This is not how to lead by example or to lead by influence. And just to finish the point, I'm sorry, I'm belaboring it. Um, he takes the example of a candle. We're coming to Hanukkah very soon. And a candle is really the example of that influence. Um, you can light as many candles as you want from one candle. It's infinite. That is leading by influence. Um, and you don't need to be very powerful. You just need one flickering light in order to light a million other, other lights. This is what Abraham our forefather did. This is what Rabbi jo uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs attributed leadership to. And this is an example that we're trying to, uh, to bring to uh, forth at Cross River. You know, it's amazing when you started Cross River, you started it at a very difficult time. Starting a bank in 08 was probably not on paper the best time. In hearing you speak, what I'm hearing is 
certain core values that you have. You've received them. Resilience, um, the ability to overcome obstacles, the ability to lead and not to demand. Do you find that when you started your company, take us to that moment if you can, where you probably had the idea at some point and probably had the voice that said, you're insane. And somehow you managed to get past that. So can you take us to that moment where these values that your parents and your grandparents and Ray Sachs has given you and how that redirected your career from what felt as I was listening to the bio as in one path and, and you almost shifted to a different, you crossed the river, not to pun the word, but, and you came a different way. Um, that's a, a great question. I'm not sure I can actually um, pay tribute to the question through the answer that I'm about to give you. Um, the, the question really deserves a lot of thoughts and a lot of uh, very careful attention. Um, at the end of the day, I really had no clue what I was doing. And that is the truth. And, and I think it's, it's really a matter of knowing that your moment is going to come. At some point, you know that Hashem is going to throw something at you, and it's up to you to identify it or not. I mean, it's like a shidduch. Like, you could go through a hundred shidduchim, but maybe the second one was the right one, and you missed it. And it's exactly the same thing. Uh, in life, opportunities are la shidduchim. There are opportunities that are meant for your mazel. And it, it, I, I guess what Rabbi Sachs did, um, to me particularly, is to try to enlighten us in identifying that mazel when it occurs. Or, rather, is to have the guts to go with it. And because, you know, you could identify 20 opportunities. Hashem is, you know, overboarding with, with uh, giving and attributes that he constantly bestowed um, us upon. There, there are definitely plenty of opportunities. It's just a matter of seizing it. At some point, you just say, I'm just going to jump in. And this was that moment when I, I know I was putting everything on the line. And I don't think I told my family about it. And because I think I would have had some very strong opposition to that. Right, right. Have you told them yet? <laughs> I think she figured it out because... <laughs> So uh, to free, rephrase Charlie's question in a different direction a little bit, at what point did you become a entrepreneur, thinking that I might want to start my own thing as opposed to working for Meridian, working for Cello, working for the other investment banks? I, I think we all are. Um, we all aspire to um, fight the establishment, um, be our own selves, because that's the way humankind has been created. The Rebuild of Shalom really created man and, and women, obviously humankind, with the ability to make decisions at the right time that will be life-changing, not only for ourselves, but for the world. We all have that capacity, that potential. And, um, and, and I, I, I would say that that moment really came when that, that shift in career um, came when um, I, I decided to stop fighting the, the bosses that I had. So in other words, you have two reactions to be a good boss. You could either learn how to be a good boss, or you could learn not to be a bad boss, right? And unfortunately, most of us, we go through life with very bad bosses. It's a, it's a big uh, quality to have to be a good boss. Very difficult. And, and at some point, you just say, I really would do things totally differently if I were by myself. If I actually had people working for me the same way that I'm somebody working for this guy, I would change totally the way I would react to that, that the, the thing, the work product I just did. And at that point, when I decided to change that status quo and to change the fact that I was being an employee and a good employee, I thought, with a bad boss, I said, I want to be on my own boss, and that, that was life-changing. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. To take us to that moment, if you can, 08, you started a company, and now it's, it's, it's the reality setting in. Right, you, you you made the jump. You're starting the and now that you, you have payroll to make, you have uh, clients to get. What's that like to be the founder of something in that inception moment? 
So we have the, uh, the power of uh, creativity. Uh, uh, Hashem gave that to us. And, and I think that we all exercise it one way or another. We all are bosses and we all run companies, whether it's called a home, children, um, our own universe, our desktop, our phone. We are all bosses of something. Just extrapolate, take that to the next level. And it's, this is really what it's all about. Um, I, I think it's a tremendous responsibility. Once you have, and by the way, this is one of our core values. One of the core values is, is compassion. It's value number four. And, and compassion standalone doesn't suffice. What do you do with compassion? So you have two ways to react to somebody. I mean, you could be very compassionate all the time, but what are you going to do about it? Okay, I feel really bad for you. Okay, you, you lost a parent, you lost your car, you, know, you, know, you had a robbery in your home, whatever the case may be, I feel real bad for you. And you could stop right there or you could actually do something about it. Then it takes you to responsibility. So caring, being compassionate, which is, by the way, an essence of being a Jew, then where do you go with that? Do you stop right there and then, you know, this is the appetizers of life? Or do you want the, you know, the piece of resistance? Do you want the main course? which is responsibility, take responsibility, take charge. This is really the corollary of compassion. So this is the way I approach my job every single day, is take charge, take responsibility. I have a thousand lives, this is the way I'm looking at it. I have a thousand lives under me that, are, that I feel responsible for, and every single time I tell my employees, I said, you think you're doing a clerical job by pushing a button, you're actually saving a life on the other side of that button. Whether you're extending a loan or you're extending a payment to somebody in need. So that responsibility is the relationship we need to have with life in general. And if we approach life and every single thing that gets thrown at, at us in the sense of first I care and I'm compassionate and then I take responsibility to make a difference, then I think the world will be a radically different place. And that's what the Jews have been exemplifying for the past 3,000 years. One thing I want to point out, because of the people that are sitting in the room here, um, what's, what's important that we don't do is think that this only applies to Yaakov, right? And this only applies once you launched your big company. A lot of what you're hearing here are the, the, the traits of life that apply at any point that you apply them. You didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to start taking responsibility. You've been taking responsibility, I would bet, way before Cross River. And the idea that me and you and everyone in this room has batting practice on the key traits that you're seeing manifested into a success in finance and an abil the ability to be an entrepreneur with almost with a thousand people working for you. It's important as you hear these lessons that you realize that they apply to one's life today in a little bit of a different context. Because compassion to responsibility can take place when you're sitting in college. And they take place when you're sitting at your business. And once you start practicing that, it manifests bigger and bigger, which I think is what you're getting at, which is very powerful. Exactly. So just to probe a little bit more, the values-driven company, the origin of it, and things like that, both in the names and in the values side. So let's start with the values. You talked about the five values. When did you formalize those? When did you crystallize these are our five values? I think from the get-go. Um, right off the bat, these values are universal. I mean, they're obviously inspired by our Jewish values. But I think the world really at large embraced them over the past 3,000 years. I mean, I think the Jews have done a pretty good job in making the world a, a perfect world. Um, so these values, we start with humility, um, I think, Everybody knows Moshe Avenue taught us that. The definition of humility, our definition of humility is Rabbi Sachs' definition of humility, which is um, it's the ability to make everyone around us feel important, empowered, and successful. Humility is not self-effacement. It is elevating others while preserving a healthy sense of self and awareness of our own qualities and values. And um, because if you are deprecating yourself, you're not doing any service to the Jewish cause. Right? We have to elevate yourselves, ourselves. Except that elevating others is a greater, higher calling. And this is what Moshe Avinu was all about. 
And this is what, this is the mark of a true leader. This is going back to the Lubavitcher Rebbe's definition, which is a great leader makes leaders. And you can only do that if you have the ability to understand that you've, there's a far greater cause than yourself. And we're just minuscule compared to that cause. In many ways, self-deprecation could be arrogance because you're so focused on self and what you're not. What you're saying here, which is a great definition from, the, from, from Rav Sachs, is that humble people are so focused on other people that they're making people feel better about themselves. Exactly. They're, they're, they're bringing them up. It's an action version of humility. I think that's great. Okay, so from the beginning, crystallizing the values. My own pet theory about the name of the company was something you talked about at the beginning. Right. Did it come from Avraham coming across the, the river? That's what it was? It was Avraham crossing the river? Yes. That's, that's great. my pet theory around this, it. That's great. This is, this so I think you when you cross the GW values. and you see the crossover building, understand it's from Avraham Avinu. That's awesome. Just want to say, just for the record, Avinu, that's awesome. He crossed the divide, the morality encounters. I mean, I, I heard a, a great, a great vart on, on uh, why did Hashem send 10 tests to Avram, uh, and particularly the last one, circumcision, you know, like, okay, give me a break. I'm 99 years old already. Um, and, and, the, um, and the shot I heard is that Avram Avinu wanted to change the world. He wanted to make the world a better place. He had caused the divide. He stood on the other side of the spiritual river. So Hashem just taught him to identify the pitfalls and the ills of the world. And that's why he went through those 10 tests. He said, I'm just showing you what the world is all about. The world is full of infanticide, human sacrifices, famine, family strife, abuse. And your people, your descendants are going to be faced with that for the rest of their lives, for the rest of eternity. I'm teaching you how to deal with that. And this, is, this was really so striking to me that we had a financial crisis at the time. And the number one culprit of the financial crisis what, what was considered to be the banks. And we decided to, make, to do something about it. I didn't know how we were going to do it, honestly. We had $9 million of capital, which is very small for a bank. We had seven people at the time and a teeny branch in Teaneck. And the regulator is breathing down our neck saying, you're going to be handcuffed for seven years because we saw what happened to all the new banks over the past five to 10 years. And they all created this big fat mess in the economy. And we're the last charter in the, in the United States to be granted. And then we decided to try to do something one loan at a time, one payment at a time, one consumer at a time. And this is really crossing the spiritual divide of banking. And that's why we call it Crossroad. Okay, so you're starting off with the seven dedicated employees bought into the values, um, starting off tight-knit family feel within the company and Correct. things like that, the typical startup. Usually the enemy of maintaining those early values is scaling. And you guys have been a rocket ship. How do you maintain, it's very easy to say, you know, we'll stick to our values when you're going to be growing like that. How were you able to, were they ever in danger, the values as you were growing? And how were you able to still do it? I think they are, attack, they are under attack every single day. Not necessarily from the inside, but also from the outside world. Um, just because of the pressure that we are um, being submitted to by the regulators, by the environment, by the competition, by the clients, by the vendors, they don't have those core values. Um, so it's very difficult to have a client, for example, who doesn't espouse your core values and you're approaching the deal in a certain way that hopefully is not only legal, compliant, but also very compassionate. And I don't think you're getting anything in return. So at some point, you're doomed to disappear. So we have to, and this is the way that the staff is looking at it. They really don't get it sometimes. But you just have to convince them and to say, no, forget it. This, there's a higher being here that rules the world that will decide how much more we'll end up making. You just paid for the effort. Put it, put it in your best. And we won't pay you for the result. We'll pay you for the effort. So people are at shock at first. Um, it's a very, very family-oriented culture. And when you have a new member in the family, the family member is 
instantly beloved. When you have a new child or grandchild, particularly, right? We share that, uh, that quality, that uh, beauty, that gift of life. And it's immediately coming into your heart and you love that individual. Why can't we make the commitment to love everybody we encounter in life the same way? It's a commitment. So we tend to focus on the concept of family much more than team. And I know that Jack Welsh and many big managers and team members and, and Campbell of Google and many others have concentrated on the, co the, the, the concept of team. In order for the team to stay cohesive, you need to replace the members that are a drag on the team. We don't believe in that. We believe that if we hire somebody who is not good for the team, it's our fault. It's our mistake. So we're going to try to recycle these people in a different position because we're looking for their strength as opposed to focusing on their shortcomings. That's the commitment that we're making to our employees when we hire them. Now, if the team member or the family member becomes poisonous to a point of putting at risk the entire environment, that's when we actually take action. But it takes a lot. So it's a very different concept, but people love that. They embrace it because it's refreshing. So it's not so much how do you grow with it and how do you scale with it, it's how do you stick with it with the people that are with you for two, three, four, five years. Because then, the people that don't have that feeling inside them, they become complacent. And they actually abuse the system. I want to make sure we have a chance to go to the crowd here. Uh, any questions from the students before we end uh, episode one? Yeah. Why don't you come on up? Better picture for you. Um, starting your company um, in 08, what were some of the biggest struggles that, that you faced, especially at the beginning, and how were you able to overcome those? That, that's a great question. I see you, you know uh, uh, your history a little bit. Um, so 2008 was very challenging because uh, the market was shutting down and uh, becoming a bank, that means extending loans, um, the, the money was extremely expensive. I mean, we had to raise deposits at four and a quarter percent. I mean, today it's a joke because everything is much more expensive than that. But at the time, it was expensive for us as a new bank to as a new entrant. So we just needed to be very resourceful and try to come up with strategies that would uh, make us different. And, and we found a couple of, uh, because in every crisis, you have huge opportunities. And we saw during the pandemic the same thing. We did PPP, we stepped in, we helped the economy, we saved 1.7 million jobs. 550,000 small businesses. So every time you have a crisis, try to identify where you can help the most. So the crisis at the time, so we had a small balance sheet, a little bit of capital, and there was one huge opportunity because there was a lack of liquidity in the marketplace. So you had AAA bonds. Government guaranteed that we're trading extremely at depressed pricing in the 60s, 70s when the baseline is 100, right? So 30% discount. Made no sense. Government guaranteed. Just because there was a lack of liquidity. So we say, okay, we're going to participate in that. We're going to try to buy as many as possible at that price because we want to reignite the liquidities. So the Obama administration at the time launched a program whereby they were giving loans to people to buy government bonds, which is quite interesting, right, as a concept. We participated in that. So we bought bonds at in the 60s, and we saw them in the 80s. We waited for the market to turn around. It took about nine to 12 months, but that put us on the map immediately, and that gave us the impetus to do the unthinkable, which is to change the business model on its head and to churn the balance sheet as quickly as possible, as often as possible, as opposed to putting five-year, 10-year, 30-year loans on our books. So today, the business is making loans online, and we keep those loans anywhere between three to 45 days. And that enables us with our capital to switch the balance sheet, to churn the balance sheet eightfold annually. That means we punch eight times above our weight. We originate almost as many loans as Chase and Wells Fargo. And we have about a thousand people, they have about half a million people. 
So this is the key here. The key is to identify an opportunity, to seize it, to learn everything about it. And that's what we learned during the, the, uh, the great debacle. And then we apply that business model going forward and it actually worked in every single instance that, where there was a need. That was great. Um, we're going to go back and come back with we have one more question. Let's do that. Yeah, jump right in. Hi, Noah Dobin. Thank you so much for coming. So you mentioned before that when you became, when you founded the, your new company, you approached it as being the boss of, you're the boss of all your little things, so you're just adding this, and you're the boss of this, the same way you're the boss of your phone, your family, etc. So when you become, when you start a new company, you take on all these new responsibilities. So how did you balance being the bosses of all these different things? So I don't think you'll ever hear me say to any of my employees when I introduce them or they introduce me, or I may be introduced to the family members that are their boss. They're my colleagues. Um, so that, first of all, that's the approach. So that's only in your head that you're a boss. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Okay. So I, I mean, in my own little world, yes, I feel very important. But in the real world, we're one of many. We're all at the same, you know, eating at the same table, um, and enjoying the same things in life. Um, the, the, what you need to understand, it's, it's the concept of responsibility again. When I say boss, it's a misnomer for taking responsibility. So, right? when somebody needs uh, somebody to daven for the Amud, you step up because you feel the responsibility. It's not that you're more important. It's not that you command the crowd, but you feel that you... You know, you have an opportunity to step in and to help the crowd, to help the Olam, the Tibor. That's what I've meant by being your own boss in every single aspect of life. And that's the way I approach my job every single day. It's just about taking responsibility. So those people that work with me at Cross River, every single one of them, I feel responsible for them. Not because it is true, not only it's true, but because I want them to feel the same towards me. Because if they do, they'll make me successful as much as I'm trying to make them successful. All right. Thank you very much. We'll be back just in a minute. We just, uh, for those who have any questions that are listening to the podcast, please email us at foundersdilemmaspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. And we'll, you'll be joining us in a couple minutes with part two of our episode with Jill Gade, founder and CEO of Crossover Bank. Mm-hmm.